Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel. You can call me Gabe. I am the CTO of Invarch, and I have been working with XCM for a while, um, mostly on use cases that are beyond asset transfers. So uh, I'm going to present to you today uh, three of those, uh, two that we are working directly with, and then one that uh, it's a proof of concept and, uh, and that we would love to have someone someone uh, actually build it uh, for the ecosystem. Uh, so let's get started. So first use case uh, is uh, the, the multi-sig uh, multi uh, module we have on Invarch, which uh, is mainly intended to provide multi-sig functionality to other chains uh, outside of our runtime. Uh, and we do that using XCM. So the idea is instead of, uh, instead of have it, having uh, multi-sig information, multi-sig computation running in every single runtime in every pair chain, you do this on one chain that then authenticates an account in another chain using XCM and then transacts over it. So this is an overview of how, how that happens. So on top here, uh, this is where the multi-sig originates. And uh, if we want to transact directly on that same network, we just uh, derive the account using these XCM converters, which I'll, I'll cover in the, in the, the next slide. Uh, we derive an account from that. In this case, it's uh, 0x123, transact, and that's, that's uh, all done. Uh, if we want to uh, transact on a different network, though, what we do is we send an XCM call to the, the, the other network. And once it reaches uh, the other network, it goes through that account derivation which uses the same exact XM converters uh, to derive that same exact account and transact. So the reason why we use these XM converters in uh, our network too is so we can have the consistent account address. We could just derive it using a simple hash of the multisig ID, but by doing that, we can provide a user experience that's consistent. Let me go through the, the messages themselves. Uh, being sent and the origins. Okay, so this is how we define uh, the location of the multisig. Uh, from the perspective of a parachain, we go up to the the relay, and then so, sorry that those junctions should be X two, but we go up to the relay chain, and then we uh, we go down to the pair ID of our network, and then we use a plurality to identify the multisig ID. The zero in that, case, in that uh, body ID is the multisig ID. And then we can, we can uh, also, this, uh, also show the interior itself that we use uh, in the Palette XM, which is just uh, the second part of the interior here. Uh, it's just the multisig identification without uh, the pair ID. So just for context, your destination would be another parachain. In this example, parents one goes up to the relay and then goes down to, in this example, parachain one, two, three, four. We also declare the, the asset to use to pay fee. Uh, in this case, it, it's, uh, in, it's an asset with index one in parachain one, two, three, four. Uh, this, is, this is a common way of identifying the native asset of that parachain. Some chains also just use the pair, uh, the pair ID directly without anything else below, but usually they'll uh, they'll also identify that as the native asset. Uh, and then um, this is uh, the definition of that asset with uh, the fungibility for how many assets we're selecting uh, to use to pay the fee. And then the call that we're gonna make this is this is. Uh, uh, unknown on our side. We only have a vector of bytes, presumably passed by a user through an extrinsic. Um, but our chain does not understand runtime calls of the, of the destination chains. And then this is the actual XCM message. So we start by withdrawing the fee asset in the destination chain, so we can then use it to buy the execution. Uh, and here I'm setting weight limit to unlimited. But in a production environment, you would want to set that as limited and use the specific weight that the call is going to take, which you can also pass uh, through the extrinsic. Uh, the idea is you would have a UI 
that has access to the APIs of both chains, and then it would take the it would, it would build a call of that chain, encode it, pass it through, pass it to to this extrinsic, and then also take the fee information, uh, the weight and fee information, and pass it here to the weight limit. Then we follow that by the transact instruction. The transact instruction is uh, mostly used to uh, just transact ex uh, in uh, runtime calls. It can also be used, uh, it can also be defined in your runtime as a more generic, uh, more generic way of just passing a, a, a blob to that runtime and then decoding into anything. But usually it's just mapped directly to a runtime call. So uh, we also pass the weight here, just passing a, a default value there. And then the call, which we defined earlier, and then we, we can add these instructions in the end to uh, make sure we're not we're not paying more and then losing those the, the, those fee assets than uh, the call actually costs. So we can use these, uh, the instruction refund surplus, which will refund the unused uh, unused assets uh, to the, the holding register, and then deposit asset will take those assets and redeposit in an account that you pass. In this case, it's the location of the multisig. So then we can uh, we can build a palette that does all of this and calls palette XCM directly uh, by passing that uh, multisig interior destination and a message. And the multisig interior there is used so that you can uh, so that the, the palette XCM can automatically add a descent origin instruction to the the beginning of your message. What that will do is actually convert your multisig uh, sorry your uh, XCM origin into what I described earlier, because once it reaches the destination chain, it's uh, your origin will only be your para, uh, your para chain, para ID. it will be just this. So this is uh, the initial origin that reaches the chain. And then we have barriers that are used to uh, mutate the origin, and most pair chains and the relay chain uh, have some of those. Uh, so what, what happens then after, it, uh, after this end origin is computed is this becomes this. So you basically append the, um, the this is still outdated too. But just imagine that's uh, the, the origin I showed earlier. Uh, what you do is you append that uh, multisig interior that was passed to the XM. It will add that to the descent origin and then the send origin instruction will be computed, will be removed from the instruction list, and will mutate the origin to this. Uh, so let's talk about the XM converters, the way we derive accounts. This is, uh, all this code I'm gonna show here in this slide is from the XM builder crate, which is basically a compilation of configurations for, uh, for uh, chain runtimes to uh, do basic things with, uh, with XCM. So this uh, is uh, the sash description. This uh, struct uh, allows you to um, take a location, describe it, uh, and then hash that, and then uh, convert it to an account ID. So convert location, input is a location, output is uh, the Blake 2, 256, hash of described location transformed into account ID. So in this describe, we can pass another struct. And in this case, that's describe family. So describe family is an initial struct that will, uh, that will initiate the description of that location. And then you can pass another further description uh, to, be, to be added to that. So here, for example, I removed everything else, just leaving this branch of the match. Uh, in this case, parents one, parent chain index, uh, which will match our, uh, our XCM origin. And then we take that, uh, the rest of that and we, we uh, add to the, the uh, we add it to the, the rest of the interior there. Uh, so this location will be described as a sibling chain and then a U32 with a pair ID, and then the rest of the, of the location, which is done here. So there's a, there's a bunch of these, uh, of these structs 
that are used to describe other um, other kinds of junctions in XCM. But for this use case, we use the describe body terminal, which takes that plurality that has the body ID, and it converts to that final uh, the final description of body ID part, which we'll then have in the ID. Uh, it will have our um, our multisig ID, which is zero in this example. So this is the resulting description. We have sibling chain, uh, compact U32 with a pair ID, and then a body with the multisig ID. So this gets encoded and then converted into account, uh, an account ID. And this is how we can ensure that that uh, XCM origin, uh, that XCM location, will always have the same account uh, in any chain that has that has this hash description with uh, describe family and at least describe body terminal. So that's also why we use it on our side, on our actual chain, so that we can derive the same exact account. So what happens if we just pass an account ID instead of passing, uh, instead of passing something that then gets derived as an account later in the destination chain? Let's, let me just give some more context. What if instead of doing this, with the multisig ID that then gets derived into an account. What if what happens if we just pass an account here and then want that account to be matched to the same account on the destination? Yeah, I'll go go to the um, multi sig origin, the first slide actually. Yeah. This? No, no, no. The the, the first yes, that one, multi location, multi sig. So you are identifying, okay, parents one. So the multi sig, multi location. Are you identifying the multi ID to other power chain, or you're constructing it in infrarch and then sending it to another power chain? Uh, so this uh, this gets computed by the by the the pallet call function once a multisig calls it. So we have a, a pallet that uh, abstracts on top of pallet XCM even more um, that gets called by multisig origins and the multisig origins contain within them their their multisig ID, which is what get gets passed in here. Uh, I, I'm just adding a zero here instead of a variable coming from the input just to uh, just for the, so the explanation. So the, the the okay, can you iterate on the whole flow, like uh, like a simple flow on uh, on what, for example, are you, what what what's being achieved, like not in terms of deriving accounts, but the whole flow, a simple flow on, on uh, yeah. So you are sending okay a multi ID from Inverge, you are right. sent. Uh -huh. So imagine this is a multisig on Inverge, okay. and this multisig holds um holds dot. Uh, here in HydroDX, and they want to uh, they want to swap that for HDX. Oh, yeah. They can then make a call here. The all the multisig logic, all the threshold uh, passing, all that happens here. Okay. So we uh, we vote on that call. That call gets gets uh, passed, and then the execution is to to a call pellet that sends the XCM call to HydroDX, and in that uh, in that message, that XCM message, it contains a transact which gets passed here, derives the account, and then it transacts and it does that swap. Okay, so so one thing is the, the XCM converter is converting the account ID because even in HydroDX, the multisig ID, con, uh, like it is the one who, which is having, which is holding those, those tokens, right? Yes. So, uh, so the dispatching of the call, the origin will be that multisig ID zero. Yeah, so that's uh, the account, the actual account ID, that that holds those funds that will dispatch that call is um, is derived from the hash of that multi location that contains the ID. So if I change that to one, it will get derived to a completely different account. But it's not it's not derived from just the the, the multi sig ID. It's derived from the complete XCM multi location that also contains that ID in one of the junctions. Okay. Okay. And also. Uh, as uh, doing uh, dispatching calls in in a, in, a, in a destination chain, uh, are there risk in like uh, associated in terms of uh, making sure that 
this origin actually did authorize to do this because uh for example hydra dx uh they don't have trust uh uh, they, they have trust assumption for invert because it's not acceptable or, or religion, right? So in a way that controlling uh, foreign addresses to make sure that actually he, the, this address authorized, this origin authorized this account because IDX just knows this account to actually do, do the swapping or do anything. Yeah. So this, this uh, Axiom origin, this is an invert origin because of the first junction. This will always come from Invarch. No other chain will be able to to uh, pretend to be this because they won't match here. In the in the pair ID junction, it will be a different pair ID. Invarch, the Invarch origin will will tell like to dispatch this call with this origin. Yeah. So the idea here is this Axiom origin. It's saying, I am, uh, I am a multisig with ID zero in the Invarch chain that's on the same relay as you in this, which could be Polkadot, so, so that this account will always be an Invarch account. Uh, this will never be able to access uh, end, uh, end user accounts, uh, externally owned accounts from people in the HydroGX chain. It will never be able to access accounts from other pair chains. This is a, uh, this is derivation below the sovereign account of Invarch. Thank you. So back to the, the, the final slide, what happens if we, uh, if we have an account here and we just tell Hydra DX that we want to, that we are 0x123 and we want to transact on Hydra DX as 0x123. Well, let me reach that. That kind of personation. So I could say, well, I just, I want to I grab some money from the treasury. Hey, Chain B or HydroDX, I'm sending you a balance transfer request from one of my users. Their address is the same as your treasury. And that's trust. So we don't want that. That's why we have all this relatively complicated uh, account derivation with hashes being made on the XCM multi location. Uh, otherwise, we just we will, we would have to ask that every single chain we're connected with that they trust us, that we're never going to do anything wrong. And not only that, that our chain won't get compromised and, and then some attacker can gain access to our chain, which then gains access to every single other chain. So that's, that's the problem that this solves. So I'm going to move on to the next topic. But before that, does anyone have any, any more questions about this? Okay. So this is something that's just a concept. We are not working on this, but we would love someone to work on this because it would be a really powerful tool for the ecosystem. So XCM can be used as a universal interface. It doesn't have to be used necessarily just to uh, send messages to other chains. It can be executed locally. And XCM is a language that has a lot of instructions capable of doing general things that we would want to do in blockchains. So. How about we make an XCM powered multi chain NFT marketplace? So imagine you have a marketplace that can, that can list and then allow users to buy and sell NFTs of any uh, standard in any chain uh, in the ecosystem, any chain that can, that can receive uh, an XCM message and execute it. Can we do that? Well, there's an indexer on top of this. This indexer would index XCM locations of NFTs. But the important part is what's below that. The UI will only will only have to understand the XCM API, and then the chains themselves uh, they would have to implement XCM Asset Exchanger, which is part of of the XCM Executor implementation. And you can write custom exchangers for anything. Uh, for Asset Hub, for example, uh, there's pal unique and pal NFTs. Both both are NFT pallets. You can write an Asset Exchanger for that. Or Moonbeam. Uh, an asset exchanger for Pallet EVM, so you can trade uh, ERC NFTs. And let's say there's a, even uh, even a chain that has Pallet Uniques and Pallet contracts for, for Wasm contracts. You could write an asset exchanger that that uh, understands those uh, and can trade those. So what happens here is you're sending an instruction to this chain 
telling, uh, telling the chain, hey, I want to sell this NFT or I want to buy this NFT. And that's a standard instruction that's part of the XM language. These spells don't understand that. But this is, this is the bridge between that XCM message and uh, the calls that buy, sell NFTs in those spells. Here's how we can match an NFT. Uh, this, uh, this is the, uh, a multi-asset structure. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, learned about this in the previous lectures, but this, is, um, this basically contains a multi-location, so, uh, so you can match to uh, an actual location of an asset. And then it has a fungibility uh, part that uh, actually says what NFT you want to sell or if it's a fungible token, how many. Um, so here. Uh, using this, we, can, we could describe with parent zero. So we're matching this in the, the chain that we are right now. Uh, we could describe an NFT by saying it's something in, the pair, in this pair chain. We don't really need this part, but we can use that to... Uh, to make sure that we're not sending messages to the wrong chains. We're not trying to buy an NFT that doesn't exist in that chain. And then we go down to a pellet instance. So this is where we would separate between an EVM NFT, uh, pellet contracts NFT, or a pellet uniques pellet NFTs. We would match this to the pellet ID of that pellet in that chain. And then we go down even further, specifying the collection. This could be uh, an integer ID, for pallet, uh, pallet NFTs uh, or other pallets that implement uh, integer IDs for the collections. Or it could be a, a general key, which is, uh, in this example, a contract ID, uh, the contract address. And then in the fungibility field, we make that a, a non-fungible asset instance, NFT ID. This way, we can match any kind of NFT, any kind of NFT, as long as it has either an integer ID in the collection uh, or a general key, uh, vector of bytes, 20 bytes, uh, and then as long as it has an integer ID. So basically all the standards. So this is how you implement an asset exchanger. Well, let's say, here we go. This is the actual trade. Um, the trade implements one function, exchange asset, uh, the origin, uh, how many assets I'm giving, how many assets, uh, sorry, the assets I'm giving, the assets that I want to receive, and then Maximal describes that uh, if it doesn't match exactly, I want to try to get as many as possible. So let's, uh, let's define uh, my NFT standard exchanger. Uh, let's say this is using uh, the NFT palette. Uh, if give is a function, uh, uh, fungible, want is an unfungible, we map that to a sell, to a buy function in the NFT palette. If it's the opposite, we map that to a sell. If it's a non-fungible to non-fungible, we map that to a swap function, uh, considering we have the, the ability to swap NFTs. Uh, we could just put an error in there uh, if, uh, if that's not possible in that standard. And then fungible to fungible, we just give an error because that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to exchange NFTs. And as simple as that, we can just add that to our XCM executor configuration. Um, I know you guys haven't, haven't seen this yet. That's in the lectures tomorrow. But basically, this implements everything that, uh, that is needed for uh, XCM message interpretation in your runtime. And there's this one uh, trait that's asset exchanger, and it defines how you exchange assets. Usually, you'll have something there uh, to, um, sorry, uh, yeah, usually have something there to, uh, to do uh, fungible uh, exchanges. There's also asset transactors, and that, uh, that's usually for fees. But um, in here, you define, um, you define then your, uh, your NFT exchangers, and bam, you have a runtime that can receive XCM instructions to exchange assets, and will exchange NFTs. So you can now build a UI that uh, sends these instructions to that chain, and it doesn't have to understand that if you're trying to buy, sell uh, an EVM NFT, or if it's a Pellet NFT, or whatever, you can just do that because you are delegating the responsibility of actually doing those operations to the chain. You're just using a universal language that it's fairly reasonable to expect the chain will implement. If it doesn't, just make it pure. All right. Well, sorry. Any questions on this? 
moving forward, XCM NFT Origins. Now, this is also something we uh, are working on at Invarch. Um, so we know that it's possible to use XCM to bridge non-fungibles. But if you don't need to do that, if you, all you need to do is know uh, if a user in this chain in, in chain A owns an NFT and then you want to use that information to do something on chain B, then um, then you you don't have to. You can just use XCM for authentication of that information. Uh, in this example, I'm going to show that with uh, I'm going to describe that with a smart contract chain being the chain where the NFTs are. But you could do the same with a ballot, considering you can uh, you can push ballots to chain A. In a smart contract chain, it's reasonable to assume that it's permissionless and you can deploy the contract yourself. My arrow's not showing. There we go. So let's imagine we have NFTs on a star. We want to... Um, do something uh, on Invarch as that NFT and not as Alice. Um, uh, what we do is we make a, a verifier contract on a star. This verifier contract, uh, it can receive the NFT ID, collection address, uh, the contract of the collection, and then the information you're trying to send over to Invarch. Uh, you call this contract, you say, hey, um, I own NFT zero, in contract 0x234, uh, I want to send this message to Invarch and do something as that NFT. Verify contract is going to ask the collection using uh, using ERC standards. Uh, it's going to ask, does Alice own NFT 0? It, re it replies yes. So we send that, we, we derive, we, uh, sorry, not derive, we build an XCM location structure for that uh, NFT, send a message over to Invarch on Invarch. We implement uh, then an NFT origin converter. Um, we have a registry of all those chains where we deployed a verifier contract. And we ask if, uh, if the contract 0x123, which is the one uh, sending the message, if they are the actual registered contract for a star. If they are, then we build a, uh, an NFT origin in our chain. We can also uh, just derive an account. But for this example, we build an NFT origin, and then we can send that to a palette that accepts that NFT origin. Or we could drive to an account and allow them to be uh, raw origin signed and call anything. So how do we map that location to an origin? So the XM locations that I mentioned here, XM location, this is that. Uh, it's a message coming from Relay going down to the star pair chain, uh, general key 0x1 through 2, 3, that's our, uh, that's our verifier contract. And below that, that's the information we pass to the verifier contract. The collection, address 234, NFT 0. And then we can use that over there to build the NFT origin. And then we just build some custom origin that says uh, this is an NFT in pair chain star, collection should say two, three, four there, and FTID zero. And then we can use this to do whatever we want. Uh, in Invarch, we're mainly using this to allow NFTs to be members of our multi-sigs, or expanding on that, to be members of DAOs. So that way, we don't have to do any complicated off-chain verification. We can just say, uh, I want to vote on a proposal. Uh, I am one of the NFTs that's a member of this, of this DAO. Send a message to Invarch saying, I vote A on this proposal. And that's what happens. It reaches there. This is registered as a member of the DAO. And it matches everything. And the vote is listed. The only, uh, the only thing to, to think here, to, 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 uh, the only issue we, we could uh, possibly have is a trust reliance on a star, right? But this reliance would happen regardless uh, as long as the NFT originated from there, we could bridge that, but we'll still be we'll still be relying on them to uh, not modify any of that. Uh, if an attacker got control of the runtime, they could easily just message everyone, just modify contracts, etc. 
Um, but this allows us to, assuming we trust, we trust that the EVM implementation of uh, Star Enough, we can easily assume that this is going to be safe. Uh, NFT is calling the contract. Contract is getting derived uh, up to here, and then contract's going to verify if those two match. If I actually own these two, then it's going to add that, and it's going to send the message over to Envarch. So, in conclusion, these are some real-world uh, XCM use cases that are beyond asset transfer. Uh, and I wanted to, to give this lecture to give you an idea of what can be built. Because uh, to this point, most of what's been said uh, and shown around XCM is how to bridge an asset from here to there, how to, uh, how to make XCM run, it, uh, run itself by uh, subscribing to versions. But these are some actual use cases, some actual things you can build using XCM that go far beyond that concept. You can tie asset transfers in this too, obviously. Uh, you can expand the NFT marketplace idea to allow for any NFT in any chain to be bought using any asset from any chain. By bridging that to a chain that can swap those assets, sending the assets back, buying the NFT. But yeah, I just wanted to show you how powerful XCM can be, uh, how, uh, how universal the language is, and how, uh, how simple it is to come up with, with uh, these ideas. Thank you. Hey. Hey. Hello. Hello. I was wondering if you could give a high level overview of the difference between the XCM and the IBC protocol of uh, Cosmos. I'm not sure I would be the best to, to give to you that explanation. I've, I've just started researching IBC myself. Um, do you know? Yes. It's supposed to go orange comparison, unfortunately. Uh, IBC is a uh, message transfer, uh, transport protocol, where, whereas XCM is a data format or a language. So they're not really comparing the same things. However, um, since uh, XCM is kind of like ag agnostics to what kind of transport protocols they're actually using, um, what you can actually do is use XCM on top of IBC, and that is completely possible. Thank you. Thank you, Keith.